you doing? This is a, a real privilege. Um, I met Kustrom years ago in Copenhagen, and uh, wherever I go, he seems to sort of pop up. Um, we were together having lunch in Manchester in the UK uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I'm really, really impressed with how you guys have uh, pulled this all together. So I'll try not to uh, delay you or bore you too much, um, but what I wanted to talk about is um, institutions, which sounds like a really boring subject, um, but they're actually remarkably central uh, to how we change things in the world, um, and also the role of openness um, as a sort of founding value of what I hope will be the, the sort of institutions that we, and in, in, in fact you, um, create in the future. So, um, I'm not a huge fan of the 20th century. Um, it gave us some really cool stuff, um, sort of cheap ice cream and fridges and some cool technology, um, but it also gave us this sort of concept of people as a mass. So the British, I think, created the first sort of concentration camp in 1900 in Kronstadt, and then we have Auschwitz, and then towards the end of the century, we have Omaska, uh, Kerata, Maniacha, and these, uh, these abominations uh, that we saw in the 1990s. And um, they are terrible, but they're part of a wider, um, a wider phenomenon, which is mass media, mass marketing, and the idea that people are basically just numbers, just a resource that you can mobilize uh, to do your business uh, or to satisfy your nationalist fantasies um, or to run your, your companies. And I think if you begin there uh, with the 20th century, then you realize just what's different or just what should be different about the 21st. So looking at uh, politics, it's probably a very complex diagram to put on the screen, but uh, this is a diagram of the Bosnian government, right? Now, the Bosnian government um, began in this blaze of sort of uh, anti-fascist glory in 1992, um, but now it spends 24% of the national GDP on the government, uh, on the state, and of that, 66% is spent on the salaries and costs of the idiots who run those institutions, right? So it's literally the opposite of what a government should be. Uh, the people are a service to the state, and pretty much anyone that has a pulse at some point will put on a shiny suit, uh, drive in a limousine, and have their 15 minutes of kleptocracy uh, running institutions of the state. That's not uncommon. Uh, there are many, many countries around the world uh, where that's true, uh, but that's just one that I feel very sad about uh, having been involved with the country uh, for many years. And really, what happens here in this culture, this sort of 20th century culture, is that we create closed systems, and within closed systems, it's very easy uh, to manipulate people. It's very easy to control people. So whether it's the cubicle farms of a large corporation um, or the, the presidency and the ministries in, in Sarajevo, because of that closed nature of the system, people can't seek an alternative. They can't change that closed system. And I think that's largely a problem of openness. In business, um, Throughout the 20th century, many people believe that businesses were, let's say, pro-free markets. Uh, whereas actually the reality is the goal of any large business was to prevent free markets. Really what they wanted to do was build a castle, build some walls, build a protection, and then engage in sort of rent-seeking activities or rent-seeking behaviors within the walls of that castle. Uh, in fact, if you look at the history of corporations, they were created... Um, by kings and, and, and so on, precisely because the merchants who were freely trading had become too powerful um, and were making too much money. In the US today, there was a very interesting uh, study from the Brookings Institution that said that actually what's going on is uh, companies are getting older and the sort of entrenched uh, existing large companies that have these good niches are very hard to dislodge. And so despite the rise of startups and the internet and innovation, in actual fact, by some measures, um, innovation is going down um, in the US because these big companies are still sitting on their uh, monopoly positions. Now this is sort of reflected in uh, a measure, an economic measure that we call sort of return on invested capital or return on assets. And from the 1960s to today, that's gone down in very, very sharp uh, decline. And there's an economist, a very interesting guy called Tyler, Tyler Cohen, who argues that what we're seeing is a great stagnation. 
So he says that we've sort of uh, eaten the low-hanging fruit of innovation. We've educated many of the uneducated. We've put farmland uh, to good use. And actually, we're sort of running out of big things to do that produce outsized returns. And I think he hopes that technology uh, innovation is, is one of our best hopes uh, for getting back to that sort of value creation. So I would say that you know, wherever you look, um, 20th century institutions are in something of a state of crisis. And what I find worrying is that many of the alternatives being posited um, are actually even more frightening. Uh, so most of the sort of alternatives, the radical alternatives are, you know, pick a century, the seventh century, that seems to be quite popular. Uh, George Bush fancied the fourth, fifth, and sixth crusades uh, around the Middle Ages. You know, pick a century, and let's go back to that point in time. And that's a really uh, dangerous and defeatist uh, position, I think. And it's certainly not the future. So, uh, a bit pessimistic uh, to start a great event like this. I apologize. But, um, thankfully, the 21st century does have some signs of optimism. There are some good things that we can pick out of the developments that give us a way forward. I think the first is that we are seeing a freer, more open, and more connected business. It's never been easier or cheaper to start a company and do something really impressive, uh, or indeed do something like Peter Sunde um, achieved as well. Uh, that is possible, and we should be thankful for that. That comes with all sorts of legal and regulatory um, underpinnings. And um, looking at things like, uh, this is a screenshot of OpenIDEO. It's an open innovation platform. Um, it's sort of a cool thing, and we're seeing more and more of this stuff becoming mainstream in the way that business is conducted today, which I think is a great thing. Um, secondly, we're sort of seeing challenges to the very existence of the traditional uh, firm or the traditional company. Um, probably impossible to read this, but it's an extract from the economist Ronald Coase and his theorem about why companies exist. And essentially, he says, companies exist to minimize transaction costs of doing business. In other words, within the company, it's cheaper to put together the various pieces of your product or service than to go out to the market and do that individually with individual players. And that held true for a lot of the 20th century. But I think now it's no longer true. Um, this is the website of a really cool little product in the UK called Blaze Lights. Um, I guess you can't see the detail too well, but essentially it's a solution to the safety problems we have with cyclists in London. So uh, this product designer, she designed uh, a simple laser light that projects the image of a bicycle about six meters in front of the cyclist and um, as a result makes them slightly safer from trucks and cars and so on. And what's really interesting is that she did this um, pretty much you know, from the garage. She created a prototype. She raised funding on Kickstarter. She went to Shenzhen and found a supply chain, produced the product, and now sells it online as well. So she's doing all of these things that would normally require a large company and lots of coordination, but she's doing them easily and cheaply and very successfully. And I think that's a really interesting change in the way that we think about business uh, today. We're also seeing um, what we think of as disintermediation. In other words, removing these sort of centralized authority points. Um, if you look at law, if you look at banking, if you look at financial services in general, uh, there are these entrenched institutions who we give our trust to. They verify a transaction or they verify a contract. But if you look at the technology underlying Bitcoin, uh, which is uh, the so-called blockchain, that has the potential to act as a distributed network-based uh, trust system. So it can verify uh, transactions, it can verify agreements, it can verify uh, contracts. And actually, this is, in a way, similar to the way that diaspora communities have transferred money around the world to help their families or to help their, their communities, which in Southeast Asia is called Hawala. It's a sort of a network-based, trust-based system of uh, exchanging money without intermediaries in the middle and without giving away lots of money uh, in commissions. So these things are not necessarily new, but actually we're finding ways to mainstream them and to put them into institutions. And I think that will play out in really interesting ways um, over the near future. Another uh, phenomenon is this idea of um, what the Clue Train Manifesto called small things loosely joined. The idea that distributed intelligence is actually more powerful uh, than centralized intelligence or centralized power. 
And uh, there's, a, there's a really great example of this that I always enjoy reading about, which was a, a military exercise called Millennium Challenge um, uh, 02, which was in 2002, run by the US Navy in the Gulf. And what they did was they got all of their best big ships together, and then they asked a retired general uh, to put together like an opposing force. And all he had was really small boats and not much technology. And so he decided that he would sort of go with the low-tech approach, and he got his boats just to run around randomly, and then on a certain signal, which was a non-electronic signal, they would swarm towards uh, these large warships. And so he won the exercise within you know, a few hours. And they said, stop, 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 that, you know, that's not right. That's not what we wanted to, to learn here. So they reran the exercise several times. And every time, his swarming approach of distributed intelligence rather than central power won. And they were very upset, and they learned some lessons from it. And he wasn't too popular either. But it's one of those great examples of, I think, what we're seeing more and more in the future which is that if you are networked, you're distributed, and you have intelligence at the edges, um, then you can do a great deal more than large sort of lumbering institutions and large lumbering organizations. Now, related to the question of trust is the idea of influence. So um, we know a lot about how influence spreads in networks. This, um, I don't know if you can see this on the screen, but it's a book by uh, Nicholas Christakis. Um, and it's, a, it's based on a study, a long-term study of uh, heart patients called the Framlington Heart Study. And what he found was that if you are connected to happy people or you're connected to obese people, you are much more likely to be happy or obese, even if you don't know those people. So there's what we call a first-order network connection, where somebody you know directly makes you 15% on average more likely to be happy if they are happy, but the effect also works at third degree connections. And those are people that you may never meet. And so what we, what we learn from this is that influence spreading through networks is a much more powerful uh, uh, sort of effect on human behavior and human ideas and human views than control or coercion. So this is the way that we change behavior if we're thinking about the, the general concept of change in the, in the 21st century. However, um, despite these trends, which are evident in both uh, commercial and non-commercial organizations today, we also have the danger of this sort of neo-corporatist agenda. Um, the idea that walled gardens and what uh, Bruce called stacks, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, etc., who seek to sort of control all of your data or all of your experience in a very tightly vertically integrated way, um, they could become the sort of corporations um, of the 21st century as we saw with the banks and the financial institutions in the 20th century. So this, this whole world is not without those dangers and that's something that we need to look to and, um, and guard against. So I'm really interested in the question, you know, how do you build institutions? Um, because building institutions is something that can give ideas a very long life. So in the UK we have the BBC. Uh, the BBC would never be created today. Um, and lots of people want to remove it because it has this sort of deeply held ethos of public service, um, you know, a, attempted objective information and so on. And the reason that those values exist in British media so strongly today is because they're protected by this institution that somebody or some people chose to set up a very long time ago. And you'll see that with lots of other um, institutions of various kinds today. So, we need to be thinking how we can contribute to creating those institutions in the 21st century rather than leave it to other people uh, to do that on our behalf. Because if they do, they'll look like Facebook or they'll look like the, uh, the Bosnian government. So we have some really good examples of how this is possible. Um, there's a fantastic book uh, by a French guy, Frédéric Laloux, called Reinventing Organizations. And he's looked at some uh, sort of long-term case studies uh, of organizations that work in a radically different way to most companies today. So a classic example is this Californian uh, tomato processing organization. It's actually the biggest one around uh, called Morningstar. Uh, Morningstar has no central management and everything they do is negotiated from employee to employee. It's a completely peer-to-peer -peer organization, but it's a tremendously successful one. And they have a concept that you need to stand behind your agreements 
and you need to always seek agreement from your colleagues in order to change something uh, or to get something done. It's a really interesting uh, organization. And in Europe, um, we've got organizations like uh, Boertzorg in the Netherlands, which is a, a nursing organization. It does home care, home nursing uh, across the Netherlands. And it's probably the biggest and the most successful there is, but it works entirely without central management. It's entirely uh, sort of self-managed among small groups. All decisions are taken by local groups, and there's no attempt to coordinate across those local groups other than just to learn some lessons from each other. And it's proved amazingly successful, so successful that I think a PwC study suggested that it was, it was essentially taking billions of euros out of uh, the cost of the Dutch economy by providing these services in such a sort of human-centric um, and sensible way. And then also in high tech, we've got companies like Valve uh, and many others right now who are trying to exist without managers. So Valve have this sort of really uh, sweet handbook for employees. Um, I'm not sure how you read it on the screen, but basically it's a guide to working without a boss. And it says, how do you work without a boss? Choose something to do, find somebody that wants to do it with you, and do it. And it's that simple. And all of their, all of their tables, uh, all of their desks are on wheels. And they say, if you don't feel that what you're doing is adding value, unhook the wheels, move your desk, and go and sit somewhere else and join some other people who are doing some cool stuff. And it sounds absurdly simplistic. It sounds naive. How can you possibly run a company like this? But actually, if you hire the right people, if you support the right kind of culture, then you can. And any downsides of this model of operation are easily offset by the huge reduction in costs when you don't have a management class um, or processes or meetings or bureaucracy um, stifling the innovation of the organization. So when we look at these um, organizations, I think there's probably four or five really common features that we see in all of the ones that we, that we study. The first and probably the most important is this idea that networks of people, in other words, human-centered networks, are basically our new superpower. There's almost nothing that you can't achieve if you get a network of people connected together in a peer-to-peer -peer way with common purpose and common values. And you can easily achieve more that way than you can by creating a sort of Byzantine uh, bureaucratic organization. The second is this concept of uh, sort of agility and adaptability. Um, these organizations, they iterate. They go through loops of change rapidly and learning through feedback at every step. They don't set out with a five-year plan or even a one-year plan and then try and uh, deliver against that plan. It's a really, uh, really common uh, feature of these successful networked organizations. Similarly, um, they regard the organization not just as a means to an end. The organization is not just a way of delivering value or a way of doing something. The organization itself has a purpose. It has what they call an evolutionary purpose, what the organization wants to be. And these organizations are sensitive to that desire or that sort of uh, direction, and they try and allow the organization to grow and to evolve um, towards its purpose. And I think the final uh, thing, going back to the idea of castles and defenses, is that ecosystems are really the new defense in this sort of connected world. Um, you know, if you're doing something and you want to protect yourself against competitors, then building a strong ecosystem where other companies, other players, and other institutions are working with you or in the same direction, uh, that's a way better defense um, than building strong walls. So I think this is what for me, a uh, sort of open organizational culture is all about. It's about being open from the inside to the outside, really sharing the true purpose and value of what you're doing. But it's also about being open from the outside in, being very sensitive uh, to external stimuli, to market dynamics, and to what others are doing um, in the ecosystem that you're working in. And what this sort of suggests for me is that we're going to see organizations that have a blended structure from the inside to the outside with a sort of liminal space in between, uh, which is neither inside nor outside. So in tech, obviously, we've learned a lot about the value of open methods. We already do uh, planning and project management in an agile and open way. Uh, we tend to work in the open, sharing uh, what we're doing and sharing signals from our work uh, on a regular basis. We use open data. Uh, to monitor DevOps and to monitor machines and to monitor things that we're working on. And we also have this wonderful sort of wiki way, the idea of open collaboration. If you see something that needs fixing, 
fix it. Um, don't bitch about it or wait for someone else to come along and, and fix it. But I think what's holding us back is that although we know about these techniques and we live these techniques in the technology world on a daily basis, we still have organizational models and organizational culture which really acts against it. So even in many tech organizations today, this is the sort of you know, shiny suited, uh, sort of sharp elbowed sociopath management model um, that sort of sits on top of organizations today and doesn't add a whole lot of value. It's probably not really needed anymore because we don't uh, require this for coordination. But we really have to move on from this and luckily, we have uh, not only the ability to do this, thanks to technology, in particular social technology, but also we have some pretty cool models um, as well. So people that are sort of studying this now are looking at, for example, um, there's a thing called the dual organization, um, conceived by a guy called John Cotter, which is you minimize your hierarchy and you build a completely second network-based structure next to it, and then you sort of weave connections between the two. We have the model of holacracy, which is very popular. Um, companies like Medium and Zappos and a few in Europe are, are trying this. So it's a collection of linked circles with no managers, entirely peer-to-peer. -peer. We've got uh, Dave Gray's concept of the connected company, where everything is based on pods supported by uh, shared services. And then we've got people like Niels Flegging in Wiesbaden in Germany, who are pioneering this sort of cellular organization, organizing for complex uh, systems and complex inputs. And these are just a few of the sort of new organizational models that we're already trying and already experimenting with. But I think, for me, if you're at a position where you have the luxury of building new institutions, um, then it's really important to understand that if you're brave enough to be open and you're brave enough to put openness really front and center of how you build those institutions, assuming that you have value and assuming that you have a strong network that wants to hear what you have to say or wants to work with you, then this can be an incredibly powerful weapon. Um, you know, the, the, the skills and the ideas and the philosophies that sort of brought us to this point in 2014 are really not the same ones that we need to build institutions that will create a better future uh, for people here and people in other countries as well. And I think openness is really at the heart of that. And I think anyone that's building a startup building a company or trying to work in sort of new non-governmental organizations um, should probably be thinking about how to operationalize that sort of openness in the way they work. And uh, that's all I had to say. So thank you very much. I caught, I caught Christian by surprise. I'm obviously uh, too early. Thank you, Lee, so much. Uh, if anyone has any question from the audience? I see somewhere someone, some internal discussion happening. Someone? Oh, Bruce. Can someone bring the microphone to Bruce? Hey. There. Uh, I was totally digging the uh, list of uh, new organizational models there. So I, you've got John Cotter. Dave Bray, and who was the third guy doing the cellular organization? Uh, Niels Flegging. How does he spell his last name? Uh, P F L A E G I N G. What the hell? Hold on. P F L A G A E A E G I N G. <laughs> G I N G. Okay, good. I would never have guessed that spelling. <laughs> Thank you very much. Pleasure. So uh, I have similar issues with the, the corporatization of, of, of these properties and the siloing. Um, where do you see future opportunity to break that apart? Um, I think some of it's technical. Um, so we need to be all sort of championing you know, the web as our best sort of open access uh, technology rather than sort of apps and FBML and various proprietary um, technologies as well. 
Um, obviously, part of it is consumer behavior, um, so favoring the open over the closed, um, which is really hard because Apple stuff is damn good, and I love it. Yeah, there you go. You've got it there too, the shiny symbol. Um, but yeah, I think part of it is also, it's beyond individual companies, it's, it's more institutional. Um, so if you look at what Tim Berners-Lee did, this act of generosity in not seeking to uh, build a proprietary web um, and not seeking to make loads of money off his, uh, his invention, you know, that's a really good example, I think, to, um, to all of us, that it's not just about CERN in that case, it's actually about everybody being connected um, and trying to remain connected even when we're sort of locked into you know, Facebook's walled garden or, uh, or Microsoft's ecosystem or Apple, etc. But it's a really tough one. And you know, you've got to be realistic as well um, because these things, are, they're not bad, they're pretty cool. They brought us loads of uh, benefits. It's not a sort of binary for or against situation. Um, but I think it will become more of an urgent issue um, in, in future. But for a better answer, you should probably ask Bruce later. <laughs>